Hello. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, introduction to PAVA systems. Um, I'm guessing everybody can hear me. I think I have you all on mute, but um, I, I hope I hope that you can. That there's there's a uh, there's some life out there. Yep, I can hear you fine. Yeah, perfect. Thank, thank you very much. One two testing. Yep. Yeah, that's all good. Okay, so um, because we have uh, uh, got this for a relative, relatively narrow uh, time slot. Um, I'm not going to uh, hang around at the start. We'll just we'll just plow on because um, we we've, we've only slated this for like 25 minutes. The idea for those of us in the UK was to um, put this in before you break for lunch. You know, so you should have exhausted your morning meetings, and uh, now you have a little 20 minutes or so to uh, listen to something about PAVA systems before sliding off for a a, a sandwich and a cup of tea. Um, the introduction to PAVA systems show uh, webinar is exactly that. If you already know uh, quite a bit about PAVA systems, and I noticed that um, from the names on the list that some of you I suspect already do, uh, you're probably not going to learn anything you didn't already know, um, except that you can comment on my, uh, my ability to do presentations. Um, so, uh, I think we've just about wild away the first minute to see if anyone else wanted to join. And so on that basis, we shall begin. Um, my name is Neil Vos. I work for uh, Ambient System based in Gdansk, who are a manufacturer of uh, public address voice alarm systems and some other uh, ancillary products. And today, what I'm going to do is run through the real basics of uh, PAVA systems and then a little bit at the end about what uh, we can do at Ambient System to support you if you're um, involved or wish to be involved in, in such a system. So um, to say if you've been distracted by me, I'm gonna turn my camera off now and we'll concentrate on the slides. Um, and at the end, we'll have a, a moment to answer questions. So you'll be very welcome to do so at the end. Thank you very much. And here we go. So. The presentation plan is simple. What, what really is a voice alarm system? Where should we use one? Um, how Ambient can help you? So that's it, the three uh, basic fundamentals um, of the presentation today. So if we start to look at the, the forward to this, um, what we're really sort of saying is the, the reason that a voice alarm system exists at all is because people react uh, better to voice messages than they do to the traditional fire alarm sounder, bells, buzzers, and so on. As we all know, if you're in some shopping center somewhere and you hear a sounder or a bell, you have little idea of what that might actually mean for you. I mean, does it mean that someone's doing a, a, a runner with a flat screen telly from Curry's, or does it mean that you're in imminent danger of uh, immolation through fire? It's very hard to say. So therefore the chance of anyone actually doing anything is, is quite low. And then if people do start to um, sense you know, smell smoke, as it were, and realize that something bad is happening. Um, again, if you've only got the sound of people are more likely to panic than if they have a clear set of instructions informing them what they should be doing. So if you've got an instruction telling you what to do, you're able to follow it, you feel relaxed, even if the situation might be slightly bad. So uh, that's it. The fundamental driver for the voice alarm system is that by giving detailed, clear voice instructions, um, uh, members of public in an area they're not necessarily familiar with will uh, carry out the appropriate action. So uh, this voice alarm system business, what, what really is a voice alarm system? So 
as we've kind of mentioned, the idea is that the fire detection system, which is uh, a selection of detectors, brake glasses, smoke detectors, heat detectors, connected to a fire panel, instead of them being connected onto bells, it uses voice announcements to um, give evacuation instruction to occupants out of that building. And the point of these announcements is that they can be specific. Um, they can be simple, so please evacuate, or they can say, please evacuate by the west stairs, do not use the lifts or do not use the east stairs, or you can basically pilot people away from danger. That's, that's the purpose. Um, and these uh, instructions are can be very simple, like very simple, or in fact can be in fact, fact be quite complicated um, uh, or quite varied depending on the number of scenarios you might have. In a large um, airport, for example, you might not want to evacuate people from a building, but you might want to move them away from a source of danger and so on. So it can be quite complex sele selection of responses to different fire events. And in the guiding uh, documents for voice alarm uh, code of practice in the UK, we have a, a number of variety of, a variety of types of system which are mentioned and specified in order of increasing complexity. Um, sim, uh, listed from V1 to V5, um, they literally start with what's the automatic procedure for announcement going through well, we, we'd like to be able to give more emergency live messages from a, um, uh, a dedicated staff member or fire officer in um, a strategic control place. Um, then you uh, have zonal message systems where it's not necessarily clear cut what the evacuation strategy will be um, until the evacuation is required. Um, and then through manual control where again more more people are involved and they're actually using live messages to encourage people rather than pre-recorded and then a, a, a type five system which is kind of you can do what you want providing you're prepared to underwrite that that is a safe way of doing um, the evacuation and managing your managing your evacuation process so from the very simple to the very complex and, and listed in inside the BS5839 code of practice, which we'll come back to shortly. In terms of the voice alarm system and the public address system, are they the same thing? Um, and I guess the answer is that um, a pub, they're not exactly the same thing, but they can do many of, they perform many of the same functions and use very much of the same equipment. Um, the, the public address system is basically for day-to-day -day general message paging, music distribution, and so on. And the voice alarm system is uh, for the life critical automated emergency paging and issuing instructions, as we've discussed. And a voice alarm system, broadly speaking, will be able to do public address. And a public address system um, would might be able to transmit these messages but would not be um, really qualified to do so within the uh, regulations within which we work. So if you start to look at the difference between the two, a public address system can broadcast music live and pre-recorded messages but um, Technically, it's a public address system alone should not be connected to a fire alarm system. It should not be active during a fire event. As such, from a standards point of view, it doesn't have standardized requirements for um, reliability and performance. Um, the voice alarm system, um, the primary purpose in investing that extra money um, is to communicate emergency messages and it will be connected to the fire alarm system and it will be active during a fire event. And the functional requirements that make that possible are effectively the information that we've listed at the bottom there. So the difference between our public address system and our voice alarm system is effectively critical signal path monitoring, uh, battery backup, multiple loudspeaker lines into larger zones where there are many members of the public, 
Um, you're going to have a message memory built in with your evacuation messages. Like we said, connected to the fire alarm system for automatic triggering, um, but potentially can be overridden manually by fire services um, and with a, a, a monitored microphone for live announcements, as we as we mentioned in the, um, the last slides about the types one to five. And the, the guiding principle in the UK um, for these standards is a BS 5839 part eight, um, which is the code of practice for the design, installation, commissioning, and maintenance of voice alarm systems. The 23, uh, 2013 edition is very is going to be replaced in the next month or so with the 2023 edition. But if you've uh, spent a lot of time becoming familiar with the 2013 edition, you're not going to be shocked by the new contents of the 2023 edition. It's all pretty much the same um, with a few extra things that people have had time to uh, consider and add on. Um, so, you know, it's uh, the, the standard or the, the code of practice is there. It covers uh, all aspects of the life cycle of the voice alarm system. And if you uh, study that and work with that, you, you're not going to go far, far wrong, far wrong with your uh, um, implementation of a voice alarm system. There are two other um, standards which are involved in life safety voice alarm uh, life safety and voice alarm systems. Um, the second one is a BSEN 50849, um, which is sound systems for emergency purposes. Now, the difference between that and the BS 5839 voice alarm system is that there are some circumstances under which the sound system for an emergency purpose may have nothing to do with fire. Um, I could give you an example of if you had a chemical factory or a nuclear processing plant where the emergencies that you were responding to were gas escape, for example. So there would be no value in connecting such a system to the fire detection system um, because we're not worried about fire. What we're worried about is gas. So the uh, BSEN 50849 covers a selection of systems which have all the reliability criteria of the voice alarm but are not necessarily connected to a fire detection system. And then the third uh, code of practice that we have floating around in the UK is a BS7827, which gives some more uh, detailed guidance on how you can use an emergency sound system in a sports ground. I think in particular, some larger public buildings and a venue, so sports ground and venues um, being essentially places of entertainment, large public buildings being um, could be places of entertainment, may also be other, other types of larger public buildings. But so fund the, the first, the first uh, and most in, widely used criteria is the BS5839, um, then 50849 for those systems not connected to fire, and 7827 for some more detail on sports grounds and so on. Um, in amongst the um, criteria that we already discussed, so we already mentioned that the system should um, have monitoring um, and so on, should have battery backup and all these things that go to make a reliable system. The standards require you or the, the standard that requires you to um, have your equipment certified and checked is part of the EN54 European standards for fire detection and fire alarm systems. So um, the EN standards, I mean, we're, we're complying to parts four, 16 and 24, but there's 30 odd parts. Um, and the voice alarm system uh, falls as a, a small proportion of the overall fire alarm standards. But the fundamental purpose of these EN54 standards is that a product that you put on the market is not self-certified by you to say that 
it will achieve the reliability criteria, it will perform under fire conditions, it's properly constructed. Um, the purpose of it is to ensure that manufacturers go to a recognized third party laboratory and that third party laboratory tests your equipment, it tests the manufacturer's equipment against a set of criteria. Um, and at the end of this uh, lengthy and extensive and expensive process of testing um, that you come up with some certificates for uh, conformity that you can form and some certificates of performance which confirm that your equipment will perform. So uh, anywhere where you're using a, a voice alarm system and you're uh, required to meet your um, those co those codes of practice that we used before those codes of practice um, particularly bs5839 and en50849 require you to use equipment that holds certification to en54 um, so that's the en54 uh, part or the how the performance and reliability of the systems is defined within the code of practice that we, we just looked at. So that kind of covers us for uh, the standards and the compliance side of things. Um, so these lovely voice alarm systems, where would I be using one? Where would I be implementing such uh, a system? And the, the answer is broadly, it's where the public are occupying a building and they have not been trained in an evacuation procedure. So the public are um, in this building, maybe it's a shopping center, maybe it's a cinema. Um, they don't know the rules. They don't know where the nearest way out is or anything, anything like that. So um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to inform them of a safe, the safe method of evacuation. So um, the typical, places that you look at, high-rise buildings of different, of many different sorts, railway stations and terminals, airports, hotels, um, sports, sports venues. Um, and if you're wondering where to find a, a, a good list of places that should have a voice alarm or SSEP, Sound Systems for Emergency Purposes Systems, um, there's a very nice uh, resource on the Institute of Sound Communication and Visual Engineers um, website. So that institute is based in the UK and has a, a voice alarm manifesto. You, you can find this using the link there. Um, it just qualifies a little bit further um, what sort of type and size of buildings you should be putting a voice alarm system in. There's no legal requirement in the UK for this. In some other countries, there is a legal requirement, but not, not in the UK. Um, however, if you go with this type of building, the buildings that are listed here, what you're doing is you're offering that degree of comfort and safety to the public, um, and you're uh, making sure that the investors who are building the building are, are kind of doing, doing the right thing. So again, retail commercial exhibition buildings, particularly when they're multi-storey, high rise, entertainments and sports, cinemas, um, larger hospitals. Um, and again, anything where the time to evacuate is longer because high rise, you know, it, it gives you by definition a longer time to evacuate. And once you, you uh, turn the lifts off, which pretty much happens whenever you have a fire event, you start telling people to come down 10 or 12 flights of stairs in an orderly fashion, you know, that that takes time. So this is why the high rise thing is, is a strong, strong contender in the, the list of buildings for having voice alarm systems. So in summary to that, we have learned that the voice alarm systems replace bells and sounders because people then respond. Um, they should be designed, installed, maintained, to the British Standard 5839 Part 8 Code of Practice, and you should use the approved equipment with the EN54 certification, which is um, men you know, mentioned in, in, those, in those documents. Um, 
once you have your voice alarm system, you can get some other benefit from it in day to day life. And you can use that to inform and entertain the public. So you can encourage them to go to the right place in the station, or you can match it up with some displays and give them some advertising and earn some revenue for the people that have, have installed it. Um, um, our understanding is pretty simple that it is the right way to evacuate buildings, those that are occupied by the public. So that's really the voice alarm system and where, where it should be used. So the last five minutes of our presentation today, we're going to just really quickly look at how Ambient System um, can help you with VA projects. So um, these are the things that we do all the time. So if, if, if you're a specification, a specifier, so you're a, a consultant and you're involved in, in writing the specification for projects, um, we, can, we can help you with that. We can help you do the designs. Um, we can help you with text that's uh, useful, you know, to make sure you're specifying the right type of thing. Um, if you're the kind of person that um, needs to price um, against the specification that you've received, we can help you interpret those specifications, understand what's going on, and we can design a system against the specification. Or even if you're just given some, uh, you know, some blank uh, drawings of a building and told, please put me a voice alarm system in there, um, we can help you with that. Um, we can then provide the uh, actual electronics, we can provide loudspeakers, we can provide um, assembly, rack building and so on. Um, if your client has requested, requested it or you would like it, you're very welcome to come to the factory and um, once the system is built and uh, take a look at that system before you take it. And then once you're on site with the system, we can help you in person or more normally um, we can assist uh, on it or virtually while you're in the commissioning phase. So, you know, our guys are available on Team Viewer and other such modern gadgetry to help you where you're when you're on site to make sure um, you're managing the commissioning process well. And after that, we can offer some support, third line support and maintenance to to make sure everything keeps keeps running in the, in the future. Um, the actual equipment itself, um, we have a range of systems going from the small to the larger scalable. So at the smallest end of things, we have uh, our mini vest devices, which are available in wall or rack mount, around about 640 watts of load. So there's still quite a lot of uh, speakers for a, a smaller, small to medium project. Um, two simultaneous audio channels and four um, zone so four separately addressable pageable zones um the next device uh, on the right of the thing here that's actually two midi vesses um you can get uh, one of those which which is half of that um which runs at about 1500 watts and three audio channels and eight lines and that uh, device there that you can see in the picture is actually um 3000 watts uh, 16 zones and effectively six uh, audio channels, um, which if you've been in uh, voice alarm as long as I sadly have, you would think that was remarkable compared to the size of racks that we used to put out 20 years ago to do um, 3000 watts and 16 zones because they certainly weren't something you could uh, tuck in the back of your car. Um, so, <clears throat> These systems, you can kind of see from the pictures, you've got touch, little touchscreen interfaces on them. Uh, you've got a fireman's microphone. They have full DSP audio processing for, uh, you know, uh, compression, limiting, delay, that type of stuff. So you can make a nice uh, audio solution from these systems with equalization and so on. They have message players with schedulers and that these have an integral PSU and, and battery backup chargers. At the larger end of things, the world is your oyster. We can go up to sort of thousands of speaker lines and simultaneous messages. Um, I think you know this this system all interface with intercoms, mobile devices, and so on would warrant a whole speech in itself. So we're not going to do that today. But um, 
it, it is available. And we also manufacture a, a wide range of loudspeakers, all of the, the types that one would expect, wall, ceiling, projector, column, horn, um, and a specialist tunnel horn for, the, for those type of projects on the right-hand side there. So, recapping very quickly what, what we can do to help you, help with design, help with quotations. We have uh, in-house <coughs> um, acoustic um, people that can do ease models. Um, we, <coughs> we do a lot of regular trainings and webinars. We can do rack assembly, factory sets, and engineers. So, so really literally everything that you're likely to need during the course of uh, a voice alarm project. If you would like to learn more about our specific uh, product, um, we have a, a wide range of additional courses on product training. Um, they're all available here. You can email me or um, uh, get in contact after this to follow up on these dates, or you can, um, you can take them from here and log on to our website, and you can go through our website through onto the, the product training page. And then there's a drop down menu for um, uh, the different trainings that you can join. Um, one of which I notice is the day after tomorrow on uh, covering basic product training on, on, our, on our, our different products. So um, hopefully in keeping with trying to do this in the allocated time to enable you to get that cup of tea, that's everything that I have to say.